You are listening to Something Rather Than Nothing. Creator and host, Ken Vellante. Editor and producer, Peter Bauer. You started by saying that you didn't know where that class would go. <laughs> you know, and I love that because that's really the principle behind uh, the work that I do also as a writer and thinker and artist and uh, certainly as a teacher and and uh, and I love Ken that you brought us back to the fact of the matter that it was really it was the novelty of the juxtaposition um, that, that in part fueled that class um, what yeah would to, what would it mean to place Charles Chestnut uh, alongside Henry James there they were contemporaries but did their lives and work intermingle and what would it mean for us to be able to put them into conversation i still think that chestnut is a to this day under appreciated um writer i'm really surprised that no major films for example have been as far as i know yet to be produced based on his work um but thank you for remembering that class uh with oh. me and for bringing us together again to have this conversation yeah, yeah. And I just want to place it. Sometimes I don't think we take times to kind of take the time, uh, at least I find, as, as, as far as placing that. And yeah, indeed, that Charles Chestnut, uh, Henry James class, for me, formatively, it's really connected to this podcast as well. So you might as well know that, too. Okay. At the same time, I was studying uh, philosophy of art with uh -huh. Dr. Cheryl Foster, uh -huh. um, at, at URI. So at the same time, it was my first, um, the right around that time, studying uh, aesthetics, encountering works of art, making judgments or making statements that are philosophical statements about aesthetics mm -hmm. and, and, and worth. And that conversation, you know, was something that I really wanted to pick up with this podcast in saying I'm outside of the academy, right? So I love being at the university and I spent time at the university, um, taught at the University of Rhode Island as an adjunct for a semester. And so like I've had that life, but also have been this, this labor guy mm -hmm. after many years putting together this program um, it was kind of just a continuation of some of those fundamental questions I was asking about, you know, why is there something rather than nothing? What is art? What are we mm -hmm. doing? Why do you create? Mm -hmm. And um, just just doing it now. So here we are. <laughs> well, and I love that you're um, giving us the example of the best way in which our, I think, our, I hope our education can manifest is by uh, taking what we've learned in that in that space, which really is a world apart, I think of of what happens in higher education at its best um, is the opportunity to inhabit what I call an island of difference for a time. And then to be um, able to take that. Um, and, and I love hearing that you took philosophy with, with of course, my most magnificent colleague, uh, Cheryl Foster, um, <laughs> into the realm of, of where we live, the realm of labor, the realm of human rights, um, yeah. the realm of public discourse and um really the, the stuff of our humanity so um i was really um very moved when uh before well when you in invited me to the conversation i i visited your blog uh ken and and to see that you were you are propelled there in that blog by not not settling on answers to questions but um letting questions yield other questions and so yeah this is just this is this is fabulous all right so now the the, the, the listeners i know we're excited to talk to each other <laughs> <laughs> um and so and so uh mary mary capello a great uh great uh english professor university of rhode island um uh writer, uh, Night Bloom, Swallow, called back in recently lecture. But before we get into lecture, which I told you we wanted to chat about, um, what were you like, Mary, when you were younger around creativity, around thinking, around books, any of that stuff? Wow. Creativity, thinking, books. Uh, it's a wonderful question. Um, I dedicated my fifth book, uh, which is called Life Breaks In, A Mood 
almanac, a mood almanac, to my kindergarten teacher and the tables of arts and crafts that she uh, invited us to. And so when you ask me this question, I, I return to, for me, um, the necessity of imagining that we all are hopefully afforded as children. And I think that, I think of everything I do as a return to the space of play and the fact that no matter how we were um, nurtured in our play, I think most of us, I think the story of childhood for everyone is pretty much a story of interruption. And so at some point along the line, usually sadly earlier rather than later, we are interrupted from the space of play. And um, I think those of us who continue to make art uh, somehow have the urge or willingness or desire to return to that place. But I guess when you ask me what I was like as a young person or how creativity uh, writing was nurtured in those days, um, I guess I go back to the question itself in part because I start to wonder actually what it is to be young. You know, what, what do we mean by young? Sure, <laughs> um, sure. You know, we, we could have, we could even have a conversation together about the whole matter of how it is we move in our lives from point A to point B. And yeah, do you, do you uh, get yeah. to be young? Do you get to be young? Do you notice when you're no longer young and you're oh, something else? You know, there you like go. That. There you go. Yeah. And what is it that is happening in us and, and through us and for us that, uh, that we consider to be something like, you know, age. But, um, you know, I was a tomboy, and I think it's important to mention that because uh, I was already as a child uh, working against the grain of my, you know, gender ascription, if you will. And I think back to how my mom was always, um, she's always upset that she'd look out the window and I'd be pulling uh, all of the other bigger kids around in this wagon that I that I had. <laughs> I was a bit of a leader as a kid. I would be the person to take friends on quests in the nearby woods and alongside the creek and such. And um, maybe like, it, I think we all have identity themes or images that we can return back to that really for <laughs> us tell us who we are. And for me, it's an image of, um, of, of an Avon cosmetics bag that uh, my godmother gave to me. She was an Avon lady. I don't know if you remember what those were. Sure, sure, absolutely. So, yeah. she, so a lot of the gifts that she gave me were Avon products. And one year, wow, she gave me this this blue bag that um, you know was a cosmetics bag, and I, I promptly turned it into a 007 briefcase and um, <laughs> <laughs> and filled it also with a rock collection that I was. Uh, a gathering at the time but you know around then like 10 ages 10 to 12 I was also coming into my own as I was thinking of myself as an athlete actually um as a young athlete and there's a sort of made for made for a tv lifetime movie story here where I was at this um catholic school that's another story um and they didn't really have much sports going on it was in a working class neighborhood um outside of Philadelphia not a whole lot of resources to draw upon. And one day, um, one of the parents got all the kids together in the schoolyard and had us running back and forth, you know, and said, let's, let's all run, see how fast you can run. And I'll never forget this feeling. Um, I, I was running and I kept outrunning all the other kids. And, but I didn't know that I had that in me. And so it was one of the first times that I had this experience of how interesting, I guess I can do something uh, with a kind of power and energy that I wasn't aware of. And so I actually started to think of myself uh, as a future athlete around the same time. And I want to mention it because the coincidence of um, reading with running uh, seems yeah. of importance to me. You know, at the same time, yeah. around the same time that I started to read uh, for myself. So which is to say, I just remember around age 12, taking it in my hands for the first time on my own, it was Anna Karenina. And, um, but I was oh, also yeah. reading things like, what else was I reading? The Lives of the Saints and um, Chi Pai Shi, um, a book of, of calligraphy and drawings that my mother and paintings by a Chinese artist that my mother was always pouring over. But if you can imagine, Ken, I don't know if you could picture me as someone who also was reading Mad Magazine on the sly and watching tag team wrestling. So well, 
I don't want you to give me a false impression. You know, you might, I'd imagine you were somewhat diminutive, but I, I, the, the size of the streak in you must have been pretty strong from <laughs> <laughs> whether it's Mad oh, Magazine yeah. or whatever. Sure. Oh, that, yeah, that's, not that's not a yeah. shocker. And, you know, it was um, my grandfather, from, who was an immigrant shoemaker. Um, I was called the Munir Mandolin and Guitar Society, an orchestra uh, um, in Philadelphia, one of the founders of that organization. Um, and a deeply humble human being. Um, he always allowed me to play first mandolin. <laughs> and as I got older and he could see that the music he was teaching me, you know, wasn't really quite cool or hip for where I was headed. Um, yeah. He would score pieces for me, like by the Beatles or, you know, yesterday for the mandolin. And, um, he died when I was uh, 14 years old. So um, it was a terrible loss for me. I kind of put the mandolin away after my grandfather died because um, the mandolin was really about my relationship to him. And I was also real lucky to, to have been nurtured by a, a wonderful couple in the neighborhood um I'll probably, maybe you've heard of jerry spinelli most people have he's a yeah i've heard that name a major um you know a young adult novelist won the newberry medal um among other uh, awards and um, oh wow yeah yeah girl you know recently made into a disney um program but eileen at the time uh, eileen spinelli who's a now a children's book writer she lived in the neighborhood where I grew up and my mom found her by way of a poem that appeared in the, what was it called? Oh gosh, I'm, I'm blanking on the name of the, it was a major, major magazine and it had a, a poem by Eileen appeared in it. My mom was a, an intellectual autodidact, um, anti-racist activist, feminist. Um, she's worth a show unto itself. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so she read this poem. My mom was a poet. And she saw this poem and she saw that the woman who wrote it lived in uh, Darby. And uh, she found her house and, and she went and knocked on the door and introduced herself. And Eileen was a, a wonderful, is a wonderful, wonderful person. And she held these sessions for kids in the neighborhood to write poetry. And um, she had her own um, children, many children from more than one marriage. They'd all be running around the house and <laughs> we'd be, we'd yeah. be poems at the table with Eileen um and uh, so I had I had wonderful wonderful influences growing up but I also grew up in a in a violent neighborhood um I a lot of what who I came to be really you know has to have ha has been about working against the examples that were given me as much yeah, as sure. working with them sure. so but that's yeah. a long, that's a long answer to your question yeah. No, no, and that's that. That's what I wanted to, and and I and I think I think you know I've been uh, I don't know maybe it's like getting older and just like looking at, it, I, I find that there's such great conversation around, like uh, even what we dropped, what we picked up, uh -huh. what we decided not to continue, yeah. what we picked up when we were forty and being like shit. I'm gonna read the Mad Magazine collection <laughs> for the next few weeks. Because, damn, I, I want to have fun in my life, you know, like I, I like like right now I want to do something, you know, and I think it's interesting to kind of like rediscover or like figure out why you did things or didn't do things. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and a, so, yeah, go ahead. Well, this is a question that really interests me a great deal. Um, the next book project that has been brewing for a while, I want to write about dormant states and what we sleep to and what we wake to and so it's very much related to what you're talking about and um i like that during the pandemic i really was made to think about this more and more because um i have a 10 year old nephew whose life has come much closer to mine that, since the pandemic began and had to do with his, you know, being required to um, learn via Zoom. Sure. And so I kind of swooped down into his life at, when this happened. And, you know, he, he didn't have any of the tools that he needed to do this from, from Wi-Fi to a tablet to, to a Chromebook to all of the things it's presumed children will have, you know, 
and that that was that was one thing and then i tried to start working with him on my own and teaching him by way of drawing because he loves to draw and as we were working together i discovered that he's probably dyslexic um he was literally having difficulty seeing words and with great great frustration um reading but i didn't know this was going on with my nephew and so it's huge huge um window opened and consequently we've spent much much more time together we live in different states so we're not real close to one another you know physically um and we my partner and i took risks in the course of this pandemic because of the sense that he needed us and uh, my his mother is a single working mom and you know there are no provisions in this country for people no, nothing are, nothing whatsoever there's um, nothing and he was made to you know he had to be home alone and no child care and the depression that he was experiencing as a result so we spent some weeks together with him in maine i have a little cabin there and my point is to say ken that watching how my nephew opened when the world was offered him yeah. as his classroom and what started to emerge in me and i started to think about all that lay in potentia i call it you know in potentia that yeah. was in us and that simply needs to be <laughs> Something has to happen to activate it. And you know, it's that Proustian notion. Do I need to I need to be rubbed in a particular way? I need for a sound to come into my sphere of influence. Yeah. I need to be eating petite madeleine again for that, <laughs> that which is already there to come into being. And so I just want to say that yes, I've been having the grace of this experience thanks to my nephew Hayden. And yeah. I love scootering and, and he, you know, when he was here he this opened a whole new world to me, um, hanging out at skate parks and, and, and having to have the, having the beautiful experience of the rhythm, the rhythms of those, of the skaters, uh, the movements of, of people at all, all ages. And you know, what happens in skate parks and feeling yeah. like being given this alternative tempo to the tempo of our times. And, um, this to me, you know, is, is an answer to your question of, uh, how is it that that which is always there, you know, what has to happen for it to, to come to light and to, to, become, to manifest yeah. itself? Manifest that which manifests, you know. Well, I want to, I want to, like, uh, you know, just capture that thought, or, you know, right there. And I tell you, it is, um, you know, it's it's a deep kernel, um, and I'm I'm very interested in your you know, as, as you get into that of dormancy, you know, like there's this state of being and becoming, right. So mm. like it is like, there's enough of it there for it to be what it is, but it's not, it's not there yet. So when it, when it manifests itself, it's kind of this whole age of art, you know, the question, right. So it's like the Michelangelo, right. So David is trapped within the granite, prior to, you know, him being sculpted, like David mm. is there. What is, what is, what preconditions are there? And it's like mm. one theory of art that the art is there. You just kind of need to dust it off versus, you know, the, kind of the wellspring that we create something out of nothing. I want to not miss this one point, Mary. If I can <laughs> sure. I get, I, I get, we, our conversation is going to be like this a little bit. I want to tell you, you mentioned Anna Karenina and I want to, I giggle to myself and I want to tell you why. <laughs> Okay, because, because with with you being like, uh, you know, it, it's just, it's a great relationship we have, like you're a prominent uh, teacher. And, you know, I've expressed that to you. But there was one time when I was mentioned, I was all, you know, I, I get excited, excitable, you're excitable. And I'm like, hey, yeah, and I'm doing my Russian literature class. And I love, you know, I love I read Anna Karenina, Anna Karenina and I loved it. And I realized right off the bat, I'm like, OK, I'm talking to Mary with some very strong views. I'm talking about the most depressing patriarchal let's build the structure to kill the woman at the end like i'm like this is not, this is not the book this this is not the book i'm ready to gush over in front of you. Uh -huh. and, and and i i totally meant in my enthusiasm even at that time to be like okay Anna Karenina, like we can do a whole episode of like yeah. dealing with tolstoy right yeah yeah like, yeah there's this magnificent art, art, uh, art, artifice and construction that goes around the story, but the story is 
fucking bleak. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, this is a great oh. point. This is a great point. And I, you know, I have to say that, well, when I was reading Anna Karenina as a, as a preteen, for me, it was more like it was a replacement for the Bible because it was so big. And it, my mom was, was a real Tolstoy fan. And so and Tolstoy would be fine with that, right? When he, when he oh, yeah, absolutely. Of, absolutely. Yeah. So, so yeah. for me, it was, about, it was about an induction into um, tome reading. <laughs> so, you know, I could, I, what I remember most of all was the size of it and the size of my lap and the fact that it was bigger than me. And so, you know, all of the things that one comes to understand about the book when one is you in college, you know, uh, that's a whole different kettle of fish. Right. But yeah. Um, so yeah, I love that. I, I love that. Story. I, um, I, uh, yeah, that I, I just, I just remember that moment. I just remember that moment because, you know, obviously Tolstoy is defensible, right? I mean, it, it, but what I'm saying is it's like a nuanced analysis. It's not like, uh, saying, well, I don't know. Nowadays, it's tough to say. I mean, but there's these hallowed works, traditional yeah. work. And I'd be like, this thing is is nothing but problems. <laughs> like that massive tome is nothing but problems to deal with. And, and it's, 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 it's fantastic in its own way. Mm -hmm. um, Mary, one of the things I, I mentioned to you that I wanted to um, – that I that I wanted you to speak to uh, specifically, and I'm going to give you a little bit of the quick background, right? So, um, you know, uh, it's it's about it's about the lecture and it's about the art of the lecture. And the reason why I want to focus on this too is because a good friend of mine, uh, Bong Kang Tuan, uh, is a refugee from Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. uh, good friend of mine, writer, poet. He teaches at Union College, which I think's up in New, in New York. Um, and he was saying, you know, when you had that professor of yours uh, on the program, just send me a reminder if you could. I want to hear what she has to say about the lecture. And I want to tell you, I, you know, I've, 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 I've learned, you know, so I, I taught philosophy. I learned lecture. I, I'm a verbal processor. I understand things as they're explained and continue to talk about them. And to keep talking about them and to interrogate them, right? But that's mm -hmm. not everybody's learning style, mm -hmm. right? So within the idea of the adult learning, we need these activities. You got to be doing things. It needs to be in, in, interactive. And it's mm -hmm. not an either or dichotomy mm -hmm. either. But I love the lecture. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and I know in you dealing with the topic of the lecture, you know, we're talking about something that is antiquated, you know, is this the, the, mm -hmm. the elbow patches professor, 1950, mm -hmm. MIT. So, so, so Mary, tell us about, tell us about the lecture and tell us why it's important. Sure. Well, Ken, um, I'm, I'm very interested in uh, the forms that we use to convey, embody, um, experience what we call knowledge and so i'm interested in creating genealogies of these forms and not taking them for granted and that that goes for the lecture that goes for the syllabus um, in academic settings the panel the conference we could even take this thing we might be calling the interview or the podcast and ask similar questions of it um you know yeah. Wh yeah. what are the tacit assumptions that um that go into these um these forms, what, what undergirds them? Why do we obey the, their, their rules? Um, what is not happening in their name? What do they allow? What do they do not allow? Sure. Can, we, can we create new forms um, that might, might make a different kind of relationship to knowledge possible? So these are the questions that, um, that's, that propel my interest in something like a lecture. Um, as a person who is an essayist and a nonfictionist, I'm also interested in um, adjacent forms to nonfiction and the essay. And so the lecture shares this beautiful history with the essay. Some of the greatest essayists and the great essays began as lectures. Um, and um, I'm, I'm very interested in what it means to um, take that which is on the written page and perform it. So what happens to, to, to print culture when we embody it literally? And um, what becomes possible when we 
when we bring our work into a public space. Um, so many, many, many prongs to my interest in the lecture, and that's just a handful of them. There are more than that as well. Um, we can talk later maybe about how once I wrote the book, I realized that um, a sort of relationship between pedagogy and violence was at the heart of my wanting to uh, re 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 redefine the terms by which this form that I think is a, is a quite beautiful one could be reimagined. Um, but yeah, what, what but yeah let me say that, yeah. What's the violence in it? The, what's the violence, the violence? In it, the, the, violent, yeah. the violence in it has to do with the way, in fact, of course, it has been associated with a kind of patriarchal top-down relationship to knowledge. And um, sure. by the, the time I got to the end of uh, transforming what was originally a lecture into a small book, I actually discovered that the etymology of rostrum has militarist um militarist um underpinnings but i don't want to give all of that away because there's this no 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 there's this beautifully no. Antici there's an anticipatory thing that happens in the book but what i realized is that i wanted to pursue the lecture as an alternative to the speech and the bully pulpit of the bully what i call the bully pulpit of the mind and in particular you know the past four years um yeah. of of um authoritarian um standing at a the standing behind the podium, um, preaching nonsense on the one yeah. hand and barking out slogans um, and, and things to which people are meant to salute. You know, I wanted to wrest the podium away from that bully and also, um, you know, re reinvent the relationship uh, to the bully that I've been internalized as we all have um, in this yeah. contemporary moment. So that's where the violence is. And I say that what I was trying to create is something like a, a new body of, of um, maybe a new political party, neither Republican nor Democrat, but I would call my group the Friends of Thought, <laughs> the Friends of Thought. And, um, and we went There's to a good political action committee. If you had a political action committee, I got new checks uh, for, for you. Okay. <laughs> Once you we form were, that political action committee, or you got a committee meeting, I'm 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 happy. Yeah. <laughs> we wouldn't give we wouldn't, we wouldn't give speeches. We we give lectures. But what do I mean by the lecture? Well, on one hand, um, I mean yes, definitely a return in some ways to a form that I have experienced in the past as a type of art. Right, a, a, a type of um, a relationship to language that doesn't know where it's going, that relies yep. on a connecting of points at the same time that it wanders. Um, so, so to return to that with the idea that, uh, that through it, we can come to be a different type of listener. So listening really is at the heart of the book. How do we, um, how do we create um, in, our, in our auditors a different, type of listener than the one that they think of them as now at the same time that you know th there's nothing nostalgic about this though there is a desire to return to a form that i think has hardly been exhausted at the same time that i'm trying to anticipate a type of lecture that doesn't yet exist my book is is a type of clarion call of sorts to say okay what form can or must the 21st century essay take and and with that um what are the needs and pressing concerns of our moment? Um, how how can we, um, in articulating those, come to invent a new version of the lecture? Now, the lecture, as I imagine it, is is a form that allows you to dream, by the way, and that at its best might make possible sleep. And now, a sleep that is not to be confused with docility. You know, I I, I've, right. I think like sure. the three things that plague our, our contemporary moment are docility as a nation state, as a, as a people, you know, docility. It's yeah. amazing to me that nothing gets people in this country to take to the street. You can do so many things, so many things as we do on a daily basis to one another, you know, and, and we still don't get, get out onto the street. When I lived in Italy years ago, yeah. every other day there was a manifestazione, you know, but anyway, so docility in individualism and, and delusional thinking. And that the three of those, I see, it seems to me sort of have dictated a, a rather troubling um, recipe for a contemporary moment. Um, so I'm not interested in docility, but I am interested in 
um, a form that might allow you and me to sleep in public. And by sleeping, I mean to allow for one type of vigilant attention to relax so that another type of attention uh, might yeah. emerge. And I mean, that is what happens when we dream. I'm, I'm very inspired by a book by Jonathan Crary called 24 um, seven, which is about uh, the contemporary um, a, 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 a bludgeoning of, of sleep. <laughs> and, yeah. And dream kind of we're in a, we're in a state of absolute sleeplessness most of the time. So um, these are some of the things that are at stake for me in, in, uh, revitalizing this thing that used to go by the name of lecture. And so if you were, um, you know, present to the sort of lecture I have in mind, I wouldn't be so interested in your getting it right and getting what I'm saying down onto paper, making sure you get every point. It's going to be on the test. Um, what I say in the book is something like, um, I'm interested in a set of questions like, what does any lecture remind you of what does it make you want to know? Mm -hmm. um, so, so, and you and I could, gen we could generate a lot of questions, you know, together about what sort of, what sort of things, what sort of questions do we want a lecture to enable us to be able to ask? Um, and, and so the knowledge you produce, in other words, in response to my lecture, I hope would be one that's not at all like um, what's on the page, you know, that I'm performing from. And in the, in the book, I, there's a, a long meditation, hopefully not so long as to weary anyone, but um, a lengthy meditation on the note and the notebook. And, um, you know, what's going on in the margins of your, of your thinking? And, and does a great lecture really allow you um, to get to that place? You know, I talk about how, um, for me, one of the things that happens in the presence of a great lecturer is that uh, it's not that I cling to every word. It's that the voice makes possible something um, and, you know, opens a space to me. And uh, maybe I will pause on a particular sentence from that lecture. And I just need to stay with that one sentence in my notebook. Now they'll they'll keep talking, but I need them to keep talking in order to stay with the one sentence that they've delivered to me. So I hope this helps to give you a sense. Well, it, it really does, and I and I like um, and and I you know I could see us talking more about it in in the future because I I mean there, there, sometimes there's these topics where or or ideas that you just see in of themselves and say like yeah I've thought about that I want to know what that is I want uh -huh. a defense I want a defense <laughs> of that and uh -huh. the moment right now is that you know we're talking about you know, the, the worst epic I've seen politically, you know, I'm 48, it's the worst epic, nothing's even close, the worst political epic as far as the negativity and the harm, the violence, the death, the killing, the mm -hmm. ignorant, mm -hmm. the uh, disavowal of truth mm. um, is, is, you know, like, so we're all, we're all still dealing with that. And I think what I get excited about is like yourself and others, or even for myself, when I'm trying to create is say, look, it's 2020 time, but there's still new things. Like we are creating many new things or have the ability to create new things. And, you know, on the political matter, we just had four years of the, an absolute frontal attack day to day on the concept of truth. And so if there's a thinker, an intellectual or a philosopher, like we're all being like, OK, let's get back to verification. <laughs> <laughs> let's get back to supported empirical evidence or statements. And let's just let's get there. And I think creative acts, like I said, that you're talking about or, or vehicles can can help us um, get get to that get to that place but we are still in recovery right <laughs> most definitely in recovery you know where do we begin with what you've just said i don't know if the antidote antidote to 
to Trump's undermining of truth. And I'm sorry I had to use his name because I, I don't like using his name. I, I think I feel yeah, like I'm using like his too. name insists his presence again and again and again and again. And that's, you know, what we dealt with in the past four years. I think this endlessly rapid fire um, in your face, perpetual presence of his name, of his person, of his tweets, of his, it, it's, it's, it's been horrifying the extent to which, to, you know, we've also allowed ourselves to be, to take the bait again and again and again. And, um, but I don't know if the antidote is empiricism. And I, I think, you know, notice how the imagination is degraded in under totalitarianism or in authority authoritarian authoritarian right. states so there's there's the truth of the imagination is our ability is built upon our our willingness um, and our ability to allow ourselves to stray to allow ourselves back to what we started with in our conversation today the relationship between the quest and questioning. And so I don't know that what we need is verifiability. I, I do think that what we need is, um, you know, what is the opening to thought of any sort? It's it's the open. It, it, it's, 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 it's the like o- openness the open. to thought. What is yeah. thought? The shutting down of thought uh, accompanied by the, sh- is accompanied by the, the, the shutting down of language, we know that one of the things that he did was to impoverish the language. You know, he proves to our students that you really don't need to know anything about the words that you that you that you utter. You know, <laughs> so everything we taught is like why why would don't I need to careful. know this? Why would I need to know this, don't Professor? Be <laughs> don't be careful with your words. There's exactly. no reason to be careful with your words <laughs> because you can wield power, and and maybe the easiest way to wield power is to be um, careless with your language, I suppose. But again, it's, it's the sloganeering. It's the, um, it's the lack of nuance. It's the reducing language to um, sound bites that are serve this like deeply consolatory function for people. You know, the easy answer, make America great. Yeah, that sounds good. You know, <laughs> get rid of immigrants. Sounds good. You know, um, this sort of, so yeah, I'm not sure that that the degradation of truth that he carried out um, is necessarily that the answer to that is, is science. For example, um, the great yeah, yeah. the greatest scientists, sure. as we know, are yes. those who ask the question no one else is asking. Who, who, um, and and you know, facts never function on their own. They're we're always interpreting them, and so I just want to yeah, I guess complicate that. Oh, uh, and I, and I. And I, I... I think I think you're I think you're absolutely right. I think that even in the term uh, as far as empirical, where there there is a closing there. There's a by definition a closing, and I think um, you know with art and creativity, where you know what we are talking about is 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 an opening. Uh, Mary, I want to know uh, what art is. So this, if you you don't have to blame me for this question. This goes back to your colleague Cheryl Foster. <laughs> You're both in good stead. Um, no, uh, the fundamental question: What is art? Well, you know me; I'm still stuck on the earlier question, but that's okay because <laughs> what, what is the problem that, of our of our moment? It's a crisis in belief, as as much as anything. If you're saying, you know, we don't know what's true. I heard a really brilliant discussion on public radio a few days ago. It might have been actually a week ago. Um, a, Dartmouth professor, and I'm sorry I don't have his name in front of me, but he was talking about Gnosticism. And um, we might want to turn to that conversation that he had in the work he's done to explain um, how um, a particular relationship to belief is what's, what's fueled, what's fanned the flames of, of, of interest in, in Trump, you know. And I like to think about the way in which he doesn't have constituents, he has followers. And so there, there is something you know, to do with faith that that's at work here. Um, and yeah, perhaps that is what flies in the face of not just truth, but being able to, to question what is true. 
okay, so what is art? <laughs> and, how is, and maybe is is art does, is there a relationship between art and these very questions? Well, use the we, we got the general cons, the general conceptual question you have, and I, I would think as far as the way you answer questions and look at it too, I would even say what is art, and then uh, thinking about it in terms as uh, its role within reinforcing or disrupting whatever mm. our day to day is. Mm. Well, you know, I, I do think that art at its best disrupts, but let's get back to the question. What, what is art? And so, you know, if you were, you and I were to play together, that's what I consider this conversation. You know, we're, it's really great to be talking to you again, again, can I always say thinking back to seeing you as a young student in my class and <laughs> here we are these years later but um you know you and i what what we can do with this question is actually to, to ask a question of each of its constituent parts and um what is there a whatness <laughs> a right. what, is art a whatness is art a what um and does that does that verb to be um even do justice to art. Um, I think about Gertrude Stein, one of my favorite quotations from her it comes from patriarchal poetry. What is it? This is a line in patriarchal poetry. What is it? What is it? It's like the, the poet is asking the question of its own poem. Yeah. And, and then she answers this with aimless, aimless. And uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you're asking the wrong question, she seems to be saying, of this work of art by asking what it is. And I wonder if there's another question we can ask um, other than what is art. I'm starting to think about... Um, it's like the experience it's like the experience of it. Let me give you an well, example. What, what, is, what, is, what is art not? Is there such a thing as unart, right. non-art? Um, when you, you told me we were going to talk together, you know, for this podcast, I... Uh, I don't know how it was. What was I looking for? I happened upon, oh, I know. My, my partner, Gene, and I, one night, we were listening to some really fabulous experimental jazz on the radio. And um, I don't know why this question came into my mind at that moment, but I found myself wondering if Trump likes music and what kind of music does he like? Yeah. So, yeah. I, I, so I Googled this question. And I found this great essay in the Chicago Tribune by Steve Kelman. He's a professor of comparative literature. And, and the piece is called, Does President Trump Like Music? It turns out that he doesn't. <laughs> so I this guess. might be a way to answer the question of what art is. Um, and I'm quoting from Steve Kelman's article. Yeah. He says, yeah. it appears that only the United States Marine Corps Band performs at the White House under the current president. And he talks about how there's this program that happens every year called In Performance at the White House. And um, in Trump land, the only music is that of the United States Marine Corps Band. Uh -huh. I think that says it all, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah it, doesn't it, it say it all? The man that hath no music in himself is fit for treason strategy. Well, America, well, here's, here's the conclusion. America, don't elect people who don't like music and don't like dogs is this that <laughs> like we can do political analysis there's two billion hours of analysis of the election saying hey tell you what let's let's lift the weary eye to he who does not like dogs in music how can right <laughs> hey, do i have a crowd wait mary we have a crowd with just that statement i'm gonna assume <laughs> Yeah, All right. I, I'm so with you. But, you know, yeah, what is art? I Art is the, I can tell you it's the place where I, it's a place, it's a place that I want to live in most of the time. And I wish I could live in the place where art resides most of the time. I think of art as an intensifier of life and um, art is that which reaches into and taps that which is most vital and puts it before us and, and asks us to um, exist in turn and in kind in its midst. And um, 
Yeah. And, you know, I think one of your questions right at the heart of your podcast is how to make something from nothing or. Uh, yeah, yes, go at yeah. it. Yeah. Go at and it. Why I, is there something happening than nothing? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I think that the artist is the person who who really insists on making something from nothing. Um, is art always and ever a, uh, a, a defense against the void? I hope not. I think that that the great artist is she who um, uh, allows the void into her consciousness and in, and, and, and in concert with it um, makes something from it, creates something um not exactly in its stead but yeah. uh as uh the, 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 what is the alternative you know i i'm not the sort of writer who um or artist who makes void like art to answer the void you know you think of somebody like beckett who does that and um, sure yeah, yeah of so course. i mean there are artists of course but um I, I think of the i was thinking though that you know uh, if we think about the question of art vis-a-vis -vis the void or the nothing, there is a way in which there is no negation in art. Art doesn't know negation. Um, and uh, in that, um, it is at its best e eternal. At the same way, way in the same same sense, though, that. Um, I think some of the greatest art is profoundly ephemeral. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, you know, I was thinking about Freud when you asked me this question and how Freud proposes that the ego can't understand the fact of its own negation. Freud could never really make sense of suicide, for example. He really... It's that, that reflective, that reflexive piece that he didn't understand within the model. I think. Yeah, he couldn't. Um, he couldn't accommodate it within his notion of um, the psyche. You know, how does one imagine one's own demolition, one's own ultimate absence? You know, it's the, right. the thing, the thing which we can't seem as conscious beings to. You can't really, get there. Really, truly be able to con con <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and, well, yet, and yet I do think that artists are people who, you know, are willing to stare into the abyss. Um, and at, at the same time, though, that what I'm trying to say is that, you know, may, maybe what the abyss and art have in common is that neither of them ultimately uh, can be negated. With um, one of the things that I'm... As, as far as your creativity and, and, and to develop what you just said, um, I do have a question is about, you know, like, why do you create? And I want to give a little bit more of a addressing around that. Right. So, Mary, you're, you know, you're um, uh, professor, you know, public intellectual, you know, artist. And within the realm, you know, I know enough about the realm of, you know, American academics is you could, uh, you know, a great lecturer, you know, students come to you and you have your sections and you have tenure and you could put out some, you know, important, important essays, which you've done and you've done these type of things. But there's also an element of where you're creating things that maybe aren't necessarily you know, the output of the academic, that there's a creative intensity, that there's a philosophical thinking, yeah, yeah. that there's a lot going on there. So on the, with that, with that dressing around it is why do you create, how do you find yourself kind of like doing it, you know, your own way? Like, yeah. you, you know, you could, I guess, you know, you could say, Hey, I'm a professor at URI, great university. And that's cool. <laughs> like, why do you create? Yeah. Thanks Ken for that question. Because I was trained as a poet and also a scholar. And so um, there was a moment in my young career where I wanted to bring uh, the poetic into the same space as the scholarly. And I, I talk about really what drives my work as that desire to wed um, a scholarly ethos with a poetic sensibility. And by scholarly ethos, one of the things I learned as a scholar was um, the necessity to take responsibility for my utterances and to realize that what I create doesn't emerge in a vacuum, to acknowledge that there have been a history of people the world over who have come before me and that I'm responsible to 
read as much as I can of the work of those others and um, to take responsibility for myself in history as a citizen of the planet. And so that's the scholarly ethos piece. And then the poetic sensibility. Um, well, this is what I was um, trained, you know, as a poet. And so I um, am very much, much interested in language as such and uh, the texture and shape and weight and power of just the word. I'm also interested in um, apposition, what it means to place things side by side that don't want to be placed side by side. And yeah, of something course, new from course, so, yeah. so this is an answer to your question. I, I was very, very lucky actually. I did not know that when I took the position at the University of Rhode Island, my first job was at the University of Rochester. and. I left that position, which was actually a more replete and, um, <laughs> one, you know, I mean, I had a lower course load there. I had a raft, raft of assistants. Uh, I had a huge research fund. I was, a, you know, it's a private prestigious university and I, moved, a good gig. To the, a good yeah, gig. I moved to the public university in order to be near to my partner, Jean Walton, who eventually was also hired at the University of Rhode Island. So we've been very lucky in that regard. But when I made that move, you know, and I, I was at that cusp of wanting to bring poetic sensibility into conversation with my scholarly training, um, I really wanted to invent a new form, you see. I was already thinking I did not want to write strict scholarship. The University of Rhode Island was a place that said I could do that and still get tenure, okay? Whereas yeah. uh, at another Amen. university, if I had stayed at the University of Rochester, I would have, they would have, they were very happy for me to write my poetry, but really would have had to publish my book in 19th century American literature and culture, which I was working on at the time. So I was 200 pages into actually two different scholarly books that I never brought to completion when I turned in the direction of writing my first work of literary, what would now we call literary nonfiction. It was yeah. a memoir at the time, Night Bloom. And so, so that's the answer to your question of how I do what I do inside of academia. I mean, I never could have told that the University of Rhode Island would have offered me really the condition of possibility to to do the work that I have come to do, which frankly, I, I left strictly scholarly writing behind around 1991 and I never turned back. So what I do now is strictly of a kind of art making, um, but it's definitely research infused. And yes, I, I do think of myself as a public intellectual. When you say, why do I create what I create? I, I think I'm doing what a lot of people hope to do as artists just trying to make strange creations in in in, in, in if i'm lucky in a beautiful nook i have to cry, try to create a nest you know where i can make what i make and what i produce is something strange i hope i'm very interested in strangeness in disruptive beauty um i think that i i'm, I'm compelled to create because i'm compelled to care for things <laughs> Um, other than, you know, the nurturance that, uh, that would be, uh, required of me as a, as a woman, you know, um, to tend and to care for ideas and, um, to, to see if I can bring some, some of these things to light, you know, in the short time that I'm given on the planet, you, um, you know, you got me thinking about, uh, I love autocorrect. I hate the way in which um, which uh, the, 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 the internet you know relies on these anticipatory algorithms and tells me what I want to ask before I've asked it. I really, really hate that. But but I like autocorrect because, of course, it also it always makes for found poetry. And the other day I was texting a friend. I forget what the context was, but I, I used the phrase, the slough of despond in my text. I don't know if many people in a text would use that phrase, but <laughs> the slough of despond. And it accidentally came out as, the sloth of despond or the sloth, you know, that cute little animal. Yes. And yes, I was I thinking, I love this. Like I want to create um, stickers or something or t-shirts with the sloth of despond, but this is an answer to your question. I think I create to avoid the sloth of despond, but <laughs> maybe, maybe, um, maybe I should uh, try to try to have a relationship with the sloth of despond because, you know, if he's a cute little animal, he might be more attractive. So Yes, this is my answer to your question of uh, why I create. I and I find those the I find like the some of the forms of communication it, like even within text and the autocorrect and all that stuff. There's a lot of like strange comedy uh, within that, and I have this. I I, I speak um, people who are close to me. Like I talk about how 
there's an aspect of like my persona that is, you know, like tied into, into the work and like, maybe kind of like, you know, like uh, pro- professional, like professional capacity. Mm-hmm. And then I look at how I text and it, it is, it is like, it is seriously, I enjoy it. I'm not critical of myself, but I mean, these are seven year old texts. I mean, these are, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's so like, it, it's so random and, and, and basic. And I, I think sometimes our communication right now, it, it, there ends up be this uh, kind of funny accident uh, uh, component to Absolutely. it. Absolutely. I want to get, I want to, I want to ask you a question. Um, and, and, and mind you, I, and part of this might be, I don't get to, to ask is I, I don't do as much of, you know, literature or conversations uh, of that nature, but I wanted to ask you a related question on, on, on memoir. And um, I uh, have listened or read all of Karlova Kanalskar's um or the autobiographical writings, my struggle. Um, oh yeah. Just I, you know, I don't know. Um, I think the total amount of uh, listening time on the series is is something like a hundred and forty hours, something like that. It's it's longer than the Bible. It's significantly longer than the Bible. Mm-hmm. And it, for me, I think I'm just simply fascinated by somebody who engages in writing about themselves, a memoir, in writing this, and the exposure that is part of it. Mm-hmm. Here are my thoughts. Here I am. Here's what I'm doing. Here's this ridiculously absurd thing that I spent half a day on or half a decade on. <laughs> <laughs> what, what can you tell me, just in, as a, maybe as an intimate sense of like, when you are writing about yourself and when you're doing the, you know, creative nonfiction or the uh, mm-hmm. memoir, how do you, how do you even do that? How do you even show yourself? Like, mm-hmm. how do you, how do you do that? How do you take that leap? Yeah. Well, what a great question. I would love to hear some time about your experience of listening to, to Nalskar because obviously I mean, you draw attention to the fact that it's, these are very long books, but you were able to listen and stay. And what was it about the writing that enabled you to do that? You know, it comes back to the writing for me. Not, And I think that's the power of Nausgaard. It's not so much what he's documenting, yeah. but, you know, how he brought those pieces of his life onto the page. And so, you know, I think this question of memoir and what it means to uh, be engaged in life writing, if we want to call it that, or um, a particular branch of nonfiction uh, that is autobiographical. I think it brings us back to the question of why, why I create again. So I realized in, in answering the question that I didn't say to you that one of the other reasons I create, which is um, to tell other people's stories actually. Um, one of the reasons I create is that I've been, I've been listening for a long time too, and I've been watching uh, the lives of the people close to me, my family in particular, but others also, people I don't know, strangers. I'm very interested in the kinds of intimacy that becomes possible between strangers, and I have had the privilege in some of my writing and some of my books to tell the stories that are not yeah. my own. You know, in Swallow, for example. I mean, I dedicated myself to the life and work of Chevalier Jackson, but I also got to know some of his patients, including an 88 year old woman who had been treated by him as, or one of his colleagues as a child. And um, we became fast friends. And, you know, this is like one of the most beautiful things that can happen, I think, in the life of a writer. Um, I got to know the children of some of the people who he saved um, and I told their father's story. I found their father's wow. story in yeah. an archive in a medical archive. I found photographs of him and he, he, uh, he presented with the most difficult case that Jackson had, um, had treated. He, he was a baby and uh, he had all of these foreign objects stuck in his throat. Um, he was fed them by a sadistic babysitter. It's a horrible, horrible story. And um, right, right. Jackson saved his life as an infant. Well, here, um, I, I f- actually, they found me. Um, I got to meet his children, you know. Um, yeah. I, could, I couldn't find out who he was exactly. I didn't, you know, because he was deceased by the time 
I wrote the book and, you know, I had his name, but I couldn't really find out much about him. And they happened upon my book and saw the photograph of their father and got in touch with me. But so all of this is to say that, um, Believe it or not, you can be a memoirist <laughs> and be as interested in the stories of other people as you are in, if in, in quotation marks, in yourself. Now, now, what does this mean? The self I'm interested in as a memoirist is a stranger to me. You know, I'm not, I'm not interested in telling my story when I write a memoir. I'm interested yeah. in testing the limits of language to bring a self into being in the first place. And to my mind, you know, the best and most interesting memoirs and what memoir was supposed to do in, at, at, when it was inaugurated in the 80s and 90s in the United States at its best. It was a genre that was trying to theorize memory, memoir, memory. Um, the great memoirist yeah. to my mind is someone who really tests the waters of the relationship between the past and the present. And, um, offers us a novel version of that relationship. That's why I want to read the memoir, not because I want to, um, you know, re-experience your experience of trauma. And so, so this is complicated, Ken, because what happened to memoir in the popular imagination is quite distinct from what it was trying to be when it was emerging as a genre in the, the late 20th century. And, um, so I, I'm afraid that, you know, um, it, it's a complicated thing that happened. Um, it became, well, one of the great things about memoir, of course, was that me memoir was intended to um, honor the ordinary. So I, I always like to compare memoir as a genre to what we used to refer to as memoirs in the plural, right? So okay. who, who writes memoirs? I'm writing my, I'm writing my <laughs> memoirs. You know? And the only person who writes his memoirs, it's always a, a he, is, yeah. you know, the memoirs were things written by a person of note who is resting on their laurel, laurels and has nothing yeah. left to do. So they write their memoirs. Well, here's what I is, did. Exactly. And so a memoir is meant to um, honor the life of, of you and me. Like you, anyone can write a memoir. Um, and not only that, but the, a memoir needn't uh, be confused with a linear uh, all-purpose autobiography. So memoir might tap into just a moment in time or even a thematic thread of, of a life. Um, and so, for example, I've written two books that could ostensibly be called memoirs, though, again, I don't call them that. I call my first book a nemic collage and my third book called Back. Um, I would want to call it a ritual in transfigured time, but they both are marketed as memoirs. And so my third book is a, uh, was written from the experience of breast cancer. And right. uh, notice I didn't say it's about breast cancer because um, the experience it's, 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 it was, it was written from that experience, meaning um, I wrote called back in response to cancer treatment and the regime that most women are put through. It's a pretty classic one and it hasn't changed in the 13 years uh, since I was treated for breast cancer slash burn and poison basically you know um, right so surgery uh, radiation chemotherapy tamoxifen ar aromatase inhibitors for five years that that trajectory really hasn't changed much um, and so this was a ritualized routine into which I had to insert myself and I have to be thankful for some aspect of it because I have to suppose that at least one piece of it, we don't know which one, um, probably saved my life. But I was trying to re-inhabit the ritual in an untoward way and I was trying to document the kind of thinking that being a woman in late 20th century America undergoing breast cancer treatment required of me. So do you yeah. see how that's really different from saying, you know, I was telling the story um, of my breast cancer experience. That is not what memoir does. And I don't know that I would call um, uh, Mal Scard's book memoir. Now, I say that at the same time that uh, I want to push against it, because unfortunately, one of the things that happened in memoir once it became popularized and got confused with um, uh, voyeuristic trauma telling, air your, dirty, air your dirty laundry okay. books, um, yeah. then all sorts of lambasting of memoir appeared in the press. 
And what else happened at this time? Well, guess what we discover? Who, who writes memoirs? <laughs> Mostly women. And so um, if you're following me, you know, memoir to yeah. my mind took a very bizarre and circuitous route. Having begun as, um, and by the way, I have a whole theory. We don't have time to talk about it now, but, you know, um, that memoir actually was meeting a need uh, at the at the height of the AIDS epidemic. Um, well, tell, tell me about that. Tell me well, about that. you know, uh, I think that I think that it meant a need at the time uh, to kind of reach into what we would consider private space and and make it public. Um, and so again, you know, if we and, and also to make public grieving possible possible. And, you know, you think about the AIDS quilt and how that was an attempt to publicly grieve, to publicly mourn when we were being uh, made to turn away from the reality of what was happening and in, protect, in particular in the queer community. And, you know, I, I think about the memoir at its outset also having played a part in a collective remembering. When I wrote Called Back, I was also trying to um, contribute to a kind of collective remembering. I had a friend who, who also had... Um, endured breast cancer treatment and she, she she said to me when I was in treatment she said uh, that she remembered that they gave her something that she felt helped her to forget what she'd gone through <laughs> and yeah. she said she said I hope they're giving you the same drug and I said oh god that's the worst thing you could possibly give me you know well you know you know the technical name for that Mary uh you know with Italian background that's the the forget about it pill right <laughs> <laughs> That's the technical, that's the Latin, that's the Latin script. Forget about it. Okay, that's good. That's good, Ken. Yeah, forget about it. So, uh, yeah, so, you know, so the necessity, remember, but, but what happened is that, uh, that a memoir came to be construed as all memoir, you know, came to be reduced to these kind of trauma ridden, uh, tell all redemption narratives. And, uh, and, you know, this plays a part in, in a wound-based culture. Um, you know, we, we've been famous for this in the United States, um, of creating populations of voyeurs and the genre since, you know, the 19th century of um, yeah, the type of genre yeah. that asks us to, to sit curbside at the, uh, you know, expense of somebody else's suffering. But so, but what happened was something really strangely misogynistic in the process, um, where then you know, the lambasting of memoir, um, either vertently or inadvertently, um, also, you know, morphed into a, a lambasting of women writers, because it's mostly women who are under. I, 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 felt, I saw that happening. And, I, and I'm glad uh, you mentioned that, because I in seeing the development of the genre, because, um, or the work that you were doing, whatever the, the, the nature of the work that you were doing, that was the first major exposure for me as 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 a reader and saying, well, okay, I know memoir, I know these, uh, but seeing you engage in that. But I also saw when you first started engaged with that, I, I would see it in the popular press, or maybe I read tons of, um, you know, London Review of Books, uh -huh, and, uh -huh. and you know, New York Review of Books, one of the main things that I read are kind of book reviews and I started to notice what you were talking about that there you know it's like it's like a genre it's like a genre critique or a style critique and then it's tied up in massive issues of women you know women and who's writing or which gender is writing it and I saw that um develop of what you're talking about and yeah. uh and uh and, and know that yeah yeah it's insidious because it's a way of um, re-domesticating women writers all over again, you know, where on the one hand, I'm trying to suggest that memoir at the outset was really intended to undo a relationship to, um, to an authorial autobiographical impulse and to uh, even alter our relationship to time, to memory, to, to question how we uh, interpret the past um you know have all these magnificent things going to um to honor the ordinary um you know it's a it's a very um it, it's an ama it's extraordinary genre really at its best but then it's it's what happened to it um that doesn't mean that you know there still aren't people writing uh, great things in its name but 
um, I had the experience with an essay that I wrote of the editor changing the title of my essay. The subtitle of my essay was an essay on blank, right? And when it appeared in print, he retitled the subtitle an essay slash memoir on blank. Oh God. I thought, what are you, you have got to be kidding me, especially um, because, because I am someone who has done a lot of thinking about the genre and also you know, theorizing yeah. about them and also the politics of the genre. And if I didn't call it a memoir, I did not want for it to be thought of as a memoir, but it really felt to me like that was a, that was a kind of misogynistic slap unconsciously so of course i would hope because well, none of the, would... none of the, the essays by men in the journal were given these subtitles you know given a subtitle that they didn't ask for yeah and i i know when, when you were talking about and particularly within uh, literature and, and and thinking back um you know uh, there's there's whole styles of literature that i think uh or that have been degraded or not or, or i would say that their that their true worth in in the work the emotional work they were doing the historical work they were doing the organizing work you know I think like sentimental novels mm-hmm. um, you know seem very feminine women and, and and like emotional and like imploring you think of abolitionist literature and there was this kind of constant critique that it wasn't you know that it wasn't rational that it right. wasn't a proper appeal right, right. that it appealed right. to the heart was very feminine and very and so it was placed in a very different realm for literature even though the stories are fantastic and you know so you get into these what you're talking about within memoir and uh or within that realm and women's role within that you know what the what happens when like a a style or a genre becomes a woman's genre right exactly 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 Needless Uh, to say, men write as much, male essays, for example, you know, are writing as, if if you will, memoiristically as women writers are, but believe it or not, there's, there's a, there's a a conception and understanding that um, it's only women who write memoiristically. Yeah. Yeah. And I... I th- and I, like I said, within literature, I think we find a lot of things like uh, of that nature. And I and I want to point, I want to point, I want to point out, Mary, and they say specifically too, as far as you know, you know, literature. Like there's this nexus of um, of literature and the way that you've taught and written, as far as um, disruption of um, kind of in, injurious categories, right? Like or things that are set up based on gender. Mm-hmm. A race, and one of the biggest points that I took as an intellectual point from, you know, well, probably from your lecture <laughs> on, <laughs> on 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 race and gender was this, and I remember it to this day was that there was this invisibility in the storytelling, right? Mm. There was this invisibility. Mm. There was these deep assumptions that in a Henry James novel, a woman's going to look like this. She's going to be wearing this. She's going to be white. You know, like there was all these, there was all this stuff that's going on in the background. And while that's there and it seems intuitive, you point out and saying, well, wait a second. How come we haven't talked about the race of this character in this? And in Chestnut, you know, and I I always thought it was such a profound point of what's invisible, Mm -hmm. not even what's shown, but what's invisible within those texts. Mm -hmm. And I think there was a radical critique Mm -hmm. The radical critique he had was started there. I always saw it as, as, as starting there. And Thank um, you. yeah, and, and, and it is a profound point because that disruption, it's like going back to the void, is that, that disruption made you see and be like, well, wait a second, is this person white? You know, is this woman, yeah. is she wearing, what type of dress is she wearing at yeah. this point? And, you know, all those um, assumptions were, there's so much behind that yeah, text. Yes, right? all, yeah. of it is, all of it is tacitly assumed. And I, I think at the time, of course, with that class, we were trying to understand the relationship between ideology and, and art, you know, and the invisible workings of language, all the work that language does that we can't see and that, of course, no writer is in control of. And, um, you know, no, no writer can control language's political unconscious. 
Um, yeah, and but certainly as you know, as educated readers, we want to be trying to make visible uh, the things that are just passing us by in these texts, right? It's the beauty of investigating it, them in those ways, I think. Having yeah, when well, I want to convey like, and when and, and talking about that, I want to convey some of the 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 raw the raw element of the thought and my reactions at that time, because you know I'm talk we're talking now and I'm 48 at that time I'm I don't know maybe 19 20 years old <laughs> some somewhere mm -hmm. uh, around there, but um, in in a literature you know in a in a literature guy and 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 a philosophy guy but the, having those disruptions were very important for my development as a radical as mm -hmm. as an intellectual as a as 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 a radical mm -hmm. to to say what what is in there what you know what what is or isn't uh, there to have that type of disruption but also to take a look at um Charles Chestnut and I'll talk about another disruption radical disruption so we have this text of Charles Chestnut a uh, very light skinned identifying as an African American man. And we mm -hmm. start studying could be the marrow tradition, the mm -hmm. conjure woman, mm -hmm. other books that he had done. And you look at the back cover and I say, Oh, wait a second, Mary Capello, Dr. Capello, this guy's white. I think I get the wrong copy. Right. I mean, cause <laughs> you look, you look and there's a white guy. He's got a suit, yeah. but, but, but that's where it starts. Yeah. That's where it starts. No, 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 no. This is an African American man, and he's an African American writer, a novel. And I think to this very day, when you and I wax quizzical a bit about mm -hmm. why more chestnut, and I just see movies of the house behind the cedars, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. his story there, mm -hmm. the Marrow Traditions mm -hmm. uh, screenplay that's already written. Definitely. Yeah. You and I have this reaction where it's yeah. like, this guy is super, like, important yeah and uh in you know as the intellectual can always tell you about super important writers <laughs> super important thinkers that have been maligned and forgotten <laughs> yes yeah there's no question he was radical um uh, and and of course yes that chestnut uh could pass and chose not to um but but uh, that very question of how we read race you know um that you're you're drawing attention to and uh, really love hearing you re-narrate your own encounter with that that which, <laughs> that which was not making sense for you and how that helped some helped something in you and so I love Ken that you've used the word disruption more than once in the course of our conversation today and I think I, I had mentioned that you know I yeah I like to say that disruptive beauty is something I'm interested in uh, achieving in my own work but disruption disruption uh we're so we're so trained against it right i mean my second book awkward is really about an inability as a nation state to 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 dwell in uncertainty at post 9 11. um the tendency to be reactive as a culture um yeah to seek vengeance to i mean now of course all of these uh, the ability just to to dwell in in, in awkwardness is harder and harder by the day because, you know, think about how the moment something happens, um, it's translated, it's mediated instantly and almost turned into a brand before we even know what it was that occurred, you know, so it's, it's hard to um, even allow for disruption in other words, because I think the way in which things get translated back to us are always already sealed over and packaged, even when, when the when the pandemic was packaged in terms of that logo, I, I felt myself really pushing against that image that we kept seeing of the virus. Um, yeah, and, and it okay. really you know yeah. led me to to think real hard with my students at the time of what does it mean as nonfictionists to represent the the virus or represent the pandemic and right what's going on you know what's how are we exerting some. Uh, relationship to the real and, and thereby um, offering a way to read it and understand it when we create pretty much overnight it seemed to me this logo I felt like it was, it was turning into a logo and then you have a brand and when you, you have a brand, brand that it becomes brand. something that's meant to be consumed it's like making it part of consumer culture um, almost immediately I was just looking back to Robert F Kennedy's um, uh, speech that he gave on the night that Martin Luther King was assassinated oh yeah yeah, I was looking back at it because I'm teaching Anna Dear Smith's notes from the field right now. 
Um, and she cites it in one of her essays as something that she asked her drama students to listen to. So I was going to return my class uh, to it. And one of the things that is very clear about that evening um, on which uh, the, the circumstances of his delivering the lecture, the lecture rather, the speech, <laughs> um, <laughs> of, was that the people in the audience didn't know yet that King had been murdered. Oh and that, that's just an, incomprehensible to us. I don't even know how to explain ah. that to my students. You know, how is it that the word hadn't gotten yet out? We can't imagine that, you know, because exactly. everything is so instantaneous. Um, and so that group, that crowd who had gathered to hear Kennedy uh, speak that night heard for the first time from him uh, the news of, of King's assassination. Anyway, yeah, chestnut disruption. Oh, and, 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 yeah. and, and, you know, I think at the, at the, at the end of the day, um, you know, I think at the end of the day, what you talked about as far as, you know, this immediacy and um, this kind of like this uh, uh, constancy of reaction, like reactive type of quality that we've kind of taken on a role uh, to react is, um, you know, we're on call all the time nowadays, yes. right? I mean, Phones. I mean, 24-7. We're on call. And even if we're good at work, we could say, well, I'm not. All right. I'm putting my work stuff over this side. You know, my my boy's 11 years old. My daughter's at the U of O and she's 19. And, wow. you know, and, and, and it, yeah, yeah. 19. My, uh, my daughter and my my middle son, 17. My little guy turns 12 tomorrow. My youngest. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. And. And, you know, so what I'm saying is, is like when it comes to the, you know, the immediacy of the phone and text and communications, it's like we're on call. We're on call all the time. And, uh, you know, I think we got to kind of, you know, figure out, you know, not being on call or allowing ourselves not to to have to always give the performance that we're up and going at it. We're doing it the right way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but um, hey, Mary, before we uh, before we uh, go here, and I would you know for now, um, I wanted to ask you if you could let uh, the listeners know, um, you know, where to find your stuff, where to find you, you know you, uh, your writing, uh, uh, your books. I sure. want to mention one one tiny thing is uh, a connection to the show. I like to kind of point these out, but. I was. I mentioned earlier in the program, uh, B- uh, Bunkang Tuan, a friend of mine uh, from the University yes. of Massachusetts, and 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 the poet. Um, we used to hang around the University of Massachusetts um, after uh, I was doing my labor studies program there. But I also took a Buddhism and uh, American literature course. But there was this great bookstore. Yeah. I should probably remember the name of it. I remember the name of the great pizza place. And <laughs> the bookstore, I went there and I was I, – your book had just come out. It was right around that time. And I said, hey, you got Mary Capello. You have to have her. And so um, – they, uh, you know, they got her, they got her book in and that was, I think it was your first one. Oh my gosh. Night yeah. Bloom. Night, okay. night, night, bloom. night bloom. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, just some of this overlap with the university of Massachusetts and, uh, uh the poets, uh, that I've had on the program I love and that. yeah, it's been, it's been really nice, but, um, in, in, in finishing up here, let, let folks know sure. how to encounter you in a way that uh, you wish to be encountered. <laughs> sure. I have a website. Um, it's www.marycapello.com. And um, my name is spelled with two P's and two L's. A lot of people get that wrong. My name literally means hat in Italian. And if you spell it with one P, it means a single hair. So you, yeah. know, you want to get that right. Oh, but, <laughs> but yeah, I think that my website is the best way to reach me and to find um, lots of resources um, for my work, and there's a contact page there with my email address. Um, that's really the best way. When I was writing my book on mood, I had fantasies of creating multidisciplinary mood rooms with people, or uh, uh, atmospheres that people can enter and exit as they please, built around a particular theme. I uh, uh, this book, Life Breaks In. You know, it's about mood, and I was trying to think of 
at that time, you know, what did we maybe need, um, what I needed, what I wanted, uh, other than a reading, you know, go hear somebody give a reading from your book. Well, yeah. I create this thing I called mood rooms. And I did have the opportunity to work with an experimental musician, Kristen Volnes, um, and create something along the order of a mood room. And, uh, but, you know, if anybody has some ideas about wanting to create atmospheres, um, together something we'd call collectively a mood room and that would you know bring to bear the, the the expertise of people from different fields film philosophy art literature that's a dream of that. that's a that's a dream of mine but of course we're in the pandemic now and you know that doesn't mean though that that such things can't be conjured and created and um well yeah. and i think that's the thing it's the the, the structures of you know i I've, I've interviewed guests who would say you know my my little kiddo like i lived in a tiny apartment and my little kiddo needed to sleep and so my art form was writing it was the quietest art form like i'm an artist mm -hmm. but i wasn't going to do anything else that kind of created noise she was yeah. also a musician that's what it was she was a musician and she said you, know, you got a kid and so then kind of creating you know with within that and that's yeah the pandemic yeah i mean it it, it forces these uh, difficulties. Um, but, um, I, I love, you know, I've, I've obviously, uh, it's, it's great to connect with you, Mary. And, and also to, um, you know, as you know, I, I really like to latch on to, you know, your, your style, your ideas, um, the, the fact that you interrogate and, and, and make sure that people understand, you know, what it is that they're thinking, you know, what, what's going on in your head and what, you know, what assumptions are there. So I, I want to thank you for continuing to do the, the, the work that you do, um, to be my kind of like literary philosopher person right in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> my secret, my secret use, but, um, uh, no, it's, 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 um, with great, ex great excitement to, to be able to chat with, with you again. And, you know, even on the last point too, with the mood rooms, yeah. I see that this podcast for me is, you know, a creative endeavor in the pandemic, right? Uh -huh. um, I'm, I'm uh -huh. creating things. I'm, I know that there are ideas out there and that there are positive energies to get through difficulty, yes. yeah. you know, to have life worth living. Right. And, um, um, so I definitely see um, your suggestions as part of that. Mary Capello, you know, I could say a million great things about you. Um, you're, you're on something rather than nothing. I want to thank you for your time. Thank you, Ken. The feeling is mutual. It's really very special to have this chance. Yeah, Yeah, and, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll bug you again a few months down the road, okay, all right? Okay, <laughs> to be All right, Mary. To be continued. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. You are listening to Something Rather Than Nothing.